Last night, after the Utsun lecture at the University of New South Wales, a friend of long standing and I went down to the Doncaster Hotel and got stuck into the house red wine. <laughs> and a couple of things struck me. It was the complete change in imagery of the bar from when I was last there. From the outside, there was a certain expectation, but you come in and there's a completely new world. And sort of wondering, what was the identity that people were, the, the bar owners were seeking in this new in, environment? And the other point which was raised by my friend was um, that sh she was looking forward to my arrival in Australia one day. And then she said, she's given up. And so I've never really arrived in Australia. So I don't relate to the Australian situation um, to the degree that I should. Wonderful presentations. And I'm looking at them in terms of my present needs. And my, one of my present needs is uh, I was required or asked to write a paper on urban design and heterogeneous cities for a journal. And I wish I had had this conference before <laughs> writing the paper. And so now I'm very worried about its quality. But at least I had enough sense that the uh, journal needed to get somebody like Susan Feinstein to review the paper before it was published. Um, she's declined to review it, so um, my worry is that the paper will get published without any serious peer review. Um, this particular journal did that once before. Um, luckily, the paper turned out well. Hugo, I really relate to uh, much of what you said, that I haven't really been in any practice since coming to Australia, done some consulting, <laughs> serious consulting in uh, Afghanistan and also in Pakistan and some other places like that. Um, but in Philadelphia, when I was um, working for the Environmental Research Group, one of the projects that we de ultimately declined to take on board was the conversion of 13 churches in Baltimore, abandoned churches in Baltimore, to um, housing for the um, Catholic dioceses. And we had to deal with Puerto Ricans, um, African Americans, sort of broad category, and Appalachian. Uh, whites, and we couldn't work out where to put the plumbing that would, and the front doors to make it possible to design interiors uh, for the, whoever could, would take over the uh, unit. Um, because the kitchens and the bathrooms, um, they're, they're given, and where you come in became very important. And so the living rooms in some communities are completely private and you really don't get invited back there unless you're close, close, intimate friends or relations. And for, my, for, for me, you come into a hallway and then you may um, go into private areas and semi-public areas. And the other project was um, designing an extension for Chinatown in Philadelphia. So you... Uh, and the goal of the Chinatown Development Corporation was to hang on to the middle class so they wouldn't move out to the suburbs, but to keep them in the city. And the question is, how do you design where you can't legally target a population mm. and market to a particular population, but it has to be open? And it's a very attractive site in terms of location. And you know, it doesn't stop anybody from moving in. And so the, some of the issues we were dealing with were really quite subtle. And a lot of them had to do with the issue of identity and external identity of being middle class, but also being part of a particular group of people. I also approached the topic from an urban designer's viewpoint. And we're talking about the future of cities. And the question is, do you simply allow the marketplace to dictate? The argument is that the marketplace understands the target populations and produces for them. But as an urban designer, we're involved in developing visions for cities or precincts of cities, and then, on top of it, thinking about how you'd get those images, visions implemented. What are the strategies for getting them done? And much of the research that we do stops before looking at strategies for implementation. And so today has been very revealing to me because it has opened up some 
possibilities in terms of thinking about strategies. There's some common themes across the presentations. This whole issue of identity, the uh, issue of diversity, however we define it, and the issue of authenticity. Okay. To me, all cities are authentic because they, ref they, they reflect the culture at a particular time. And so saying something is inauthentic raises many, many questions which are really open to debate. And so you take the example of, um, that I've given of designing for Chinatown. I mean, what's an authentic middle-class Chinatown look like and feel like when you're there? We in urban design and in most des design fields deal with generic solutions and adapting generic solutions to particular situ situations. And I get, I get upset with people who say, the Radburn plan does not work here. I don't mind it if you say the so-called Radburn plan doesn't work here, because what happens is in adapting particular generic solutions, the original ideas tend to get lost. And so it's a superficial copying of an idea. Okay? But what we really need in the design fields are clear images of social agenda, and then we can start thinking about design. You can't really think about design-led social change, except at the margin. And so I'm always looking for gene new generic ideas. I'm looking for, Ruth, I'm looking for the building of bridges. What are the bridges? And what is the spatial implication of, the, of, of those bridges? What kinds of places are they? What's the range of them? And intuitively, I have a feeling for what they might be. Um, I'm looking for somebody to give me the answer so that I can worry about the design issues. Okay. So, and Marla, this engaging community in cultural uh, production, I think is an extraordinarily important idea, but how do you really deal with it on a larger scale, at a precinct scale? And what does it mean at, if you're dealing with a new town? And I've been very much influenced um, Ruth, going back further, I'm older, um, to the work of Herbert Gans and his wonderful little article on integrating new towns. It was only about three pages long. He talks about micro segregation and macro integration. And then you're dealing, I think, with the bridges. And the question is, what are, the, what are these bridges? And so I start to think, well, if you're dealing with, um, say, the, the Israeli example of uh, new towns where ethnic groups are plotted into small areas and then the integrating elements of the schools and the shops and so on. But somehow it seems to me that we need m much more than that. And so I'm delighted to have been here. I'm delighted with the conversation and make, making me go back and think about what I've just been writing about. Um, so I need to rethink this particular segment and uh, introduce these ideas here and so on, uh, which is a damn nuisance actually. Um, so today's been, to me, a, a wonderful day. Uh, lots of ideas, uh, um, but I do approach things from, a, from this design viewpoint. I'm always asking the question, uh, so what? So what do you do with this? So thank you very much to all of you. I'm delighted to be able to have this little opportunity of putting my own little view forward. Thank you.